My name is Mita Lay. My name is Willy Wonka. I'm something of a video essayist, a commentator, a fashionista. So quiet up and listen down. Cause we're gonna get started and we're gonna talk about musicals. Okay, beautiful doves. I'm in a totally different setup. Actually not totally different setup as you can tell. I have my curtain and my couch where I usually record, but I thought, you know, I've been recording in the same space for literally like a year now and I renewed my lease, so I'm still here. And visually, I'm just like a little unstimulated, so I thought I would change it up by shifting everything to the right. So yeah, now I'm by my desk. Um, and I think it's kind of nice because you got like the foreground, the midground, and the background. There's lots of depth here and it's just something different. I don't know. We're also like closer, so. Okay, so I have a confession. I am a theater kid and I know I'm a theater kid because I came across this TikTok video on my For You page from the account Broadway Rave. And I haven't looked too into it, this is not sponsored, but it seems like a concert, like a traveling concert club event where the DJ plays nothing but Broadway soundtracks. And so as I was watching this video on my For You page, in my head I was like, oh my God, this seems like so much fun. Um, and I literally went to their event page and I was like, when, is the, when are they coming to New York? And then I go to the comments <laughs> on that TikTok video and literally all the top comments are like, this is my nightmare blunt rotation and this triggered my fight or flight response. So uh, clearly I'm a little different. I'm not like the other girls. But you know, most of my friends don't like musicals and they're very adamant about it. Musical theater has a lot of haters. Theater kid is used most of the time derogatorily and the clearest example I can think about that right now are all the jokes of Kylie Jenner getting the ick because her boyfriend Timothy Chalamet has revealed himself as a theater kid. What are you doing? I'm making chocolate, of course. Timmy, we just went viral, baby. Uh, you like get off your phone. Uh, you just have to like pay attention when I'm doing and even on an industry level, as of recently, I've noticed that musical productions coming out of Hollywood have even skirted the label of musical in their marketing. So speaking of Timmy, Wonka came out a few weeks ago and none of the marketing promo leading up to this movie gave any indication that it would be a musical. And it was. I know some of you will be saying, Mina, the original Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was a musical. I don't know why you were surprised. But the thing is, Timothy has yet to debut any singing in his career. I would argue to say that his career trajectory has been heading towards like the moody drama actor category, which is very far away from the musical category. It'd be like Robert Pattinson or Jacob Elordi starring in a musical. It just, it would feel weird. Though, apparently, Robert Pattinson went crazy voice acting for The Boy and the Heron. So maybe a Robert Pattinson musical is in the works, I don't know. By the way, I'm not saying or I'm trying to imply that musicals are like less serious or a less prestigious medium. It's just very different. It requires a different skill set that many film actors don't have, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But the backstory for Wonka is that the director, Paul King, didn't actually audition anyone else for Willy Wonka and just offered Timothy the role, which is another conversation all in itself. But he offered him the role after seeing his high school musical productions that were uploaded onto YouTube. So I guess Timothy does have like singing stuff out in public. Here was a man with no dream and no plan, then one crazy night I found. But I don't think you would necessarily know that unless you were deep in his fandom trenches. So for most of us, casting him was less of an indication that this is going to be a musical than if they casted a Broadway star like Aaron Tveit. Paul Kang, who also directed the Paddington movies, told the British Film Institute that he decided to make Wonka a musical to call back to the 1971 version and also to Roald Dahl's original intentions. He said, it would seem crazy to me to have an Oompa Loompa come on and not hear the Oompa Loompa music. That's what God intended. We were inspired by the previous film's choices. Dahl used music in a huge amount of what he did. In his books, there's always songs or verses and poetry that's supposed to be a song, and the Oompa Loompas are singing all the way through it. I think he's such a precise, rhythmical writer that music sits very comfortably with his work, whether it's Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory or Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. It was clearly very important to him. The irony, though, is that Roald Dahl actually famously didn't like the 1971 version of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, in part because the movie focused too much on Willy Wonka when Charlie Bucket was the protagonist. But despite King being so hell-bent on the musical angle, there was no singing featured in the trailers, which is usually the dead giveaway that this is going to be a musical. 
And yes, I know you get a bit of Hugh Grant dancing and singing the Oompa Loompa song, but it's unclear whether it means there's going to be music permeating the entire movie or if this is just like a little Easter egg for old Willy Wonka fans. If we take a look at the 2012 Les Miserables trailer in comparison, it literally features three different songs. I'm living with you, my work is starting. We'll be ready for the schoolboys. More recently, the 2021 West Side Story musical opens up with Rachel Zegler singing. Tonight. And you may be saying, this is a cop out, Mina. Those movies are based on existing, very famous musicals. Obviously, we know they're going to be musicals and watching their trailers. But consider the movie Cyrano, which came out in 2021 and was directed by Joe Wright. Wright's version was based on the famous play Cyrano de Bergerac that's been adapted so many times, most often in non-musical form. When you watch the trailer though, you know this version of Cyrano will be a musical because the actors are shown singing. Cry for, and I won't be ashamed for someone to say. Wonka isn't the only secret musical culprit of the season though. The new Mean Girls movie coming out soon, which is based on the Broadway musical version, doesn't feature any singing. And on top of that, the trailer doesn't even feature a song from the original musical. Instead, they use Olivia Rodrigo's song, Get Him Back. We as women have to be able to support each other. The color purple is also pretty obscure about its musical genre. You do get a glimpse of actress Fantasia Brino singing, but it literally lasts one second and then the rest of the trailer is edited like a high production drama. And neither of these movie trailers note that these movies are based on Broadway musicals. Instead, they make reference to their original non-musical source material. This is not like necessarily a new way of marketing. Um, we've seen musicals marketed as not musicals before. Disney's Frozen, for instance, comes to mind, which is actually crazy because it became so big because of one of the featured songs in the movie, Let It Go. But I feel like now there are all these articles coming out about this phenomenon because we're seeing this trend movie after movie. The Hollywood Reporter quotes a studio marketer who says, if you spell out the word musical, people have preformed opinions. Musical has a connotation that characters are going to sing every word and audiences can be turned off. My issue with this is mainly that if someone doesn't like musicals, they are probably going to be really upset that they were conned into seeing a musical. But insincere marketing aside, for this video, let's just chat about the movie musical and why it seems audiences have been turned off by them. Because if you're a fan of old movies or you've studied film history, you know that musicals at one point used to be the biggest genre in Hollywood. So... What happened? Matrimony is baloney. You'll be wanting alimony in a year or so. The first true musical film was The Broadway Melody, which premiered in February 1929. True musical, as in it features dialogue within song and dance. Thinking of you on the level. Life was a song. You came along. I know some of you are going to protest and say it was the jazz singer of 1927, but while this movie features song and dance, there is no dialogue moving through the song and dance. The Broadway Melody's famous marketing slogan was, all talking, all singing, all dancing. This movie was really successful and was the first sound film to win the Academy Award for Best Picture. While the movie generally got positive reviews at the time, film critic James Berardinelli wrote of the film in 2009. The Broadway melody has not stood the test of time. Some of its deficiencies can be attributed to ways in which the genre has been reshaped and improved over the years, but some of the results of the studio's validated belief that viewers would be willing to ignore bad acting and pedestrian directing in order to experience singing, dancing, and talking on the silver screen. They had a Bugs Life 40 theater in Animal Kingdom um, in Disney World. I don't know if it still exists because Disney calls rides every so often to replace them with flashier ones. Don't get me started on Tower of Terror. But the plot of this 4D movie wasn't good. What made it fun was the fact that you could feel different sensations like ants running across your feet. It was novel. Likewise, the Broadway melody was successful and fun at the time. And part of being successful means people try to copy you. Hollywood subsequently pushed out an onslaught of movie musical productions, but many of these musicals were non-narrative, so they had no plot. And they were really just meant to showcase the singing and dancing talents of the performers. Hollywood released 50 musicals in 1929, almost one per week. But human attention span is short, right? So naturally, people grew tired of these types of musicals. We just had too many of them. It was no longer novel. Old Hollywood studio exec Daryl Zanuck even said, there were so many musicals you wanted to vomit. So the studios took a break. 
audiences weren't biting, and also musicals were getting expensive because the studios were bringing in these top Broadway stars and songwriters. But starting in the summer of 1932, Zanuck and choreographer slash director Busby Berkeley mapped a new approach to musicals. Zanuck, who was working at Warner Brothers, believed musicals had a lot of earning potential if they were just done a different way. But Jack and Harry Warner just heard the word musical and then logged off for aforementioned reasons, tired, washed, expensive, etc. But Zanuck decided to go into production anyway. In August 1932, he bought an unpublished novel by Bradford Ropes called 42nd Street. 42nd Street is about the Great Depression and showcases the gritty underground world of the Broadway theater. The electric press is up. Come on, higher, higher, I want to see the lakes. There's slang, drug abuse, violence, and sexual activity. It was pretty scandalous. Where is it? Where is it? 42nd Street's budget totaled $400,000, which was a lot for the time. To avoid resistance from Jack and Harry, Zanuck and Berkeley would shoot the musical numbers at Vitagraph studio at night so that the Warners wouldn't realize the kind of movie he was making, and then shoot the dialogue scenes at the Warner studio in Burbank. Thankfully for Zanuck, Jack and Harry loved the finished musical version and it went to the public, becoming a huge success. Berkeley would go on to work on 19 musicals at Warner Brothers. What made 42nd Street different from previous musicals was that Berkeley used a single moving camera that was fluid and dynamic, moving with the musical numbers. Prior to this movie, musicals were shot from a static position in front of a stage. Berkeley's new style brought a cinematic experience to the musical versus before when directors just tried replicating the experience of watching a theater stage. Early 20th century Hollywood musicals acted as star attractions. The plots were simple because the focus was on the special talents of the actors. For example, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers were popular for their nine collaborations between 1933 and 1939 at RKO. As someone who's seen a few of them, I can say that the dancing? Great. The plots, not so much. Horace Hardwick, the developer. I'll stop him. And the studios knew this, even recycling the same plot points over and over again because the movie content didn't really matter. Astaire and Rogers were the product. Director Vincent Minnelli, who directed a number of famous musicals like Meet Me in St. Louis and In American in Paris said, the Fred Astaire dance numbers were the only bright spots in musicals in the late 1930s, though I found the stories inane. To be fair, a lot of different movie genres suffered from plot recycling, not just musicals, but the nature of the musical made it difficult for there to be really good narrative plots. These films had a two hour running time and every time there's a song, you have less running time for a story. So it was just easier for studios to recycle the same plot points but insert different songs. And they were able to do this because most 1930s musicals were backstage musicals, aka the musical numbers were separate from the events of the story. When a song comes on, the plot takes a break. Director Stanley Donan said, the whole drift of the Busby Berkeley kind of musical was towards realism. Everything happened on the stage and you were supposed to suspend your imagination just long enough to believe it was happening on the stage. You always saw where the music came from. By the 1940s, we got the rise of the integrated musical, aka a musical where the songs fit into the narrative structure of the movie, like The Wizard of Oz. Why, if I had a brain, I could, I could while away the hours, conferring with the flowers. Since musicals were so successful during this time, studios were hell-bent on highlighting the musical part of these movies in their marketing. Theatrical trailers focused more on the film's musical spectacle, like Gene Kelly's dancing, than on its story. If you look at the Singing in the Rain trailer, they literally give you a preview of every single song that is sung in the movie. Good morning. Good morning. We've talked the whole night through. Steve Cohen wrote about how the Hollywood musical was a star-driven genre above all else. He notes that the films were crafted to reiterate the star's persona not simply by having him or her play a certain type of character in the plot, but through the numbers. Scores and choreography were tailored to suit the star's special abilities, with plots designed primarily to offer ready excuses for a song or dance number in the distinct style associated with the star. For example, Judy Garland was marketed with the persona of an unglamorous but talented small-town girl. And this was achieved not only because of the types of roles she played, but also the songs she was told to sing. Songs like Over the Rainbow, In Between, You Made Me Love You, and The Trolley Song all hark back to this idea of a humble, talented girl. The golden age of movie musicals is considered by many critics to be the 1930s to early 1950s. The genre's decline in the 50s correlates with the development of the television industry and consequent slumping interest in film. Barry Keith Grant explains in his book, The Hollywood Film Musical, the rapid decline of musicals in the late 1950s was at least partly the result of an ever-widening gap 
between the music used in the movies the studios were making and the music an increasing percentage of the nation was actually listening to, namely the new rock and roll. Some also argue that the decline in musicals was furthered by the creation of music videos. But I hesitate to say musicals have been strictly on the decline. We're no longer in the golden age, true, but musicals have come in and out of style throughout the years. Some of the better box office performers have been West Side Story in 1961, The Sound of Music in 1966, Grease in 1978, Chicago in 2002, Mamma Mia in 2008, A Star is Born and Bohemian Rhapsody in 2018. Yes, musical biopics do count. And of course, most Disney movies. Anyway, you could literally fill a book with all the developments and growing pains of the musical genre, and people have. But I just wanted to give a brief overview and, and highlight the early 20th century because back in 1943, Hollywood released 65 musicals. 65! Compare that to now when people complain that we're getting a lot of musicals even though, you know, it's just, it's not comparable. So, let's discuss why a lot of people today don't like musicals. To understand why we don't like musicals today, we have to understand why we liked musicals to begin with. Part of the reason was, of course, the novelty of sound in the 1930s. You never could remember where the microphone was, boss. But also American audiences loved musical movies in the early 20th century because this time period was really rough. It was war, then depression, then more war. People wanted an escape. In 1943, during the height of America's involvement in the war, 40% of the films produced in Hollywood were musicals. And as I said, musicals were star vehicles. Today, we don't have the same star system. What I mean by that is back in the old Hollywood days, a celebrity's name in a cast list was enough to guarantee success, obviously depending on who that celebrity was. But, you know, Marilyn Monroe, Ginger Rogers, Gene Kelly, these stars had star power. Nowadays, a person's name isn't enough to guarantee success. Taylor Swift, for instance, was in the musical movie Cats in 2019. Cats is considered to be a box office bomb, making $75 million on a budget of 80 to 100 million. Taylor Swift is literally like one of the biggest pop stars right now, if not the biggest, and she wasn't even the only star in the movie. There was also Judi Dench, Jason Derulo, Idris Elba, Jennifer Hudson, Ian McKellen, Rebel Wilson, and James Corden. And yet the movie still bombed. All right, I just wanna be clear that I wrote this before looking at the Cats footage and it's just so clear to me. It's so clear to me why it bombed. Scott Mendelson explains this phenomenon for Pup News. Tom Holland is not a movie star. Not in the sense that he could open an original movie starring as just some guy. However, he is bankable as Peter Parker. Margot Robbie suffered dual bombs this time last year with Amsterdam and Babylon. But she's helped Barbie become 2023's biggest movie. That's modern movie stardom in a nutshell. Movie stars are now mostly added value elements in IP plays. The previous Hollywood star system was able to work because we didn't have social media. In the before times, we didn't get the privilege <laughs> of seeing out-of-pocket stuff that celebrities do in real life. But with social media, we got to see them partying on private islands and making that weird Imagine video within the confines of their Beverly Hills mansions during the height of the pandemic. We got to see the kind of lives they actually live and we're more aware of the disparity and unfairness created by these industries. At the same time, on a less like class analysis level, humans are just weird, cringy, and awkward. This reminds me of this TikTok I saw made by Ricky Montgomery. I'll play a little clip, but he basically talks about how difficult it is to be a musician these days because of how much you have to rely on marketing yourself on TikTok. You still have to post TikToks ad nauseum and distance people and make yourself look actively uncool in front of the world because the world has found a way to put most of the marketing burden onto the artist who's supposed to be working on art. Like the Beatles didn't have to get up every day and worry about if they were gonna post their TikTok too late into the day that day. You cannot go work on an album for three months in the woods anymore because then you wouldn't have an internet connection to make the TikToks about the experience and vlog it and oh, do, 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 do. You have to, this infects your mind. Because of having to market yourself on social media, you can't be that like edgy, mysterious musician that used to exist back in like the 90s. You have to be embarrassing. <laughs> so because of social media, we're more aware of how celebrities are just like us in the worst ways and also so different from us in the worst ways. Of course, there are people who are still parasocial, but I would actually argue that parasociality is on the decline. I have no numbers to back this up, by the way, so take this all with a grain of salt, but like I've been thinking about 
this recently. And there's just been countless articles about how people are viewing social media as entertainment and less as a way to socialize. And I think the result of that switch is that we become more aware that influencers and celebrities online are entertainers and less as friends. Even scrolling through TikTok, most of us spend time on our For You pages over our following pages. The For You page is content driven. We're seeing the best performing videos across the board and less of the videos made by our favorite creators. The people that I actually follow on TikTok, I probably see like 50 50% of the videos they post, if even that. If you compare this with the good old vlogger days of YouTube, people mostly hung out in their subscription boxes and tuned in to every video their favorite creator made. Creator driven, not content driven. But back to movie stars. During the early 20th century, we didn't have access to them. The only access we had was through their movies, and because these studios would create archetypes for their actors and actresses to fall into, the lines between character and person became blurred. I've talked about this before, but Marilyn Monroe was like constantly cast in very similar roles. A ditzy and naive girl with high sex appeal. And so naturally, many people thought that this was literally her personality in real life because she didn't play anything else on screen, and we had no access to her off screen. You must think I was born yesterday. <laughs> Well, sometimes there's just no other possible explanation. Now we have a lot of access to people off screen. We're more aware that a person is different than their character. And on a marketing front, you don't have to see every Amanda Seyfried movie to have access to her. Whereas before, seeing a Judy Garland movie was the only way to see her. When I ask people why they don't like musicals today, the go-to answer is usually, oh, because people don't burst out into song in real life. In the later 20th century, there's been more interest in acting as a realist art form, and that coincides with the growing popularity of Stanislavski-derived acting techniques like the method. Method actors, like them or not, if they're good, if they're good, can bring a really good sense of emotional realism to the material. But this was a budding concept for Hollywood in the 50s and 60s. Prior to that, most film actors relied on more dramatic ways of acting that wasn't reflective of the way that real people acted in real life. So the gulf in terms of acting style between a 1940s musical and a screwball comedy was less apparent than the gulf in acting style between a musical today and a dramatic comedy. Nowadays, acting like a real person is considered good acting. It's the standard. You don't have to be method, but people would prefer to not notice that you're acting. Rarely do we have moments like Cary Grant doing a full somersault on the floor anymore, and Katherine Hepburn speaking in a transatlantic accent. You seem quite contemptuous of me all of a sudden. An accent that the majority of Americans did not even speak in. But for musicals, realist acting is still sort of impossible. Bursting out into song isn't something we do in real life, so anytime someone does it, it removes you from the reality of the movie. But also, Broadway actors are not even trained to invoke this kind of realist acting anyway because that's not the language of musical theater. I was watching the Sideways video essay, as one does. I love Sideways. He was literally my introduction to video essays, and I just like pray that he returns to YouTube one day. But I was re-watching his essay on the music in Les Miserables, and he talks about how the film acting trained actors ruin the structure of their songs by trying to invoke real emotions. So for example, Anne Hathaway's character Fantine sings a song as she's dying. And Anne Hathaway, who I think is a great actress, by the way, sings as if she's actually dying. First thing that I did was just learn how to sing the songs properly. And then you start to apply the reality of the scene. I can't sing this pretty because it'll take you out of it. From a movie acting standpoint, fantastic. From a musical standpoint, you can't hear what she's singing and the thematic structure of the music, which is an integral part of storytelling in the musical medium, falls apart. Right here when Fontaine is dying in his hallucinating cassette, we get a really important piece of music. Come to me, cassette, the light is fading. This song comes back for Eponine singing about getting ditched by Marius. On my own, pretending he's beside me. And again when Valjean is dying and giving Cosette away to Marius. On this page, I write my last confession. This piece of music is supposed to represent, like, if you love it, let it go, or something like that. Fontaine is letting go of Cosette, Eponine is letting go of Marius, and Valjean's letting go of Cosette. Hathaway here is so fixated on trying to get that gold plated validation that she ends up shopping the song so hard that you can barely tell that that's what she's singing. Come to me. The light is fading. If this is your first time hearing Les Mis, it's almost impossible for you to be able to parse that these three pieces of music are all the same. And so with the way that we've come to expect film acting to be, making a movie musical doesn't really work anymore. Howard Ashman actually talked about this. 
If you don't know who Howard Ashman is, he's a legend. He was a playwright, theater director, and lyricist responsible for writing all of the classics, uh, <laughs> particularly the songs in Beauty and the Beast, The Little Mermaid, and some of Aladdin, but he unfortunately died of AIDS before that movie could be finished. There's a big, big problem with music and film. In live action, music and live action, you know, the only truth I know about it is it usually doesn't work. Music may have more license in the animated film in the same way that it does in the theater, simply because the level of reality is different. There's no game being played by a theater audience. We know that's happening right in front of us, and it's painted scenery, and it's not real. So what he means is musicals work on stage because when you're watching a play, there's a barrier to reality. You are aware they're on a stage. You can be fully immersed in the story, but there's an awareness that what you're seeing is a performance, it's not real. Same with animated movies. It's all drawn, so you know it's not real. That doesn't mean you can't be emotionally invested, that means you can't not cry when Simba loses his dad, but if one of the characters breaks out into song, you don't have to remove yourself from the movie briefly to think, does that make sense? Because no, it doesn't make sense. That's the point. It's all animated. It's not real. Live action musicals, though, try to replicate reality as much as possible because film tries to replicate reality. So when the characters break out into song, it's discombobulating because wait, we just had a serious dramatic scene and now you're just going to start singing? It's weird. Which brings us to the question. The expectations for movies have changed in a way that have made the musical genre less palatable to massive audiences compared to the 30s and 40s. But if people hate musicals so much as they say, why does Hollywood still make them? Do you want another one? Do you want another one? Honestly, it's a mystery. I haven't been able to find any sort of industry intel on the business side of Hollywood musicals, but I will say that probably a lot of it has to do with laziness. Most musicals adapt Broadway musicals, and so you basically have the script already, and then you also have the intellectual property, which will guarantee at least a portion of people coming to see the movie, people who are already fans of said intellectual property. This is also the explanation for why we have so many franchise movies in general, and why it's rarer for an original musical to debut on the screen. Music supervisor Matthew Sullivan, who's worked on Chicago Hairspray and Dreamgirls, told Variety, with Broadway adaptations and animation, you have a built-in audience. I've been in the room a few times pitching new original musicals. It is a scary prospect for studios. Going back to what I said earlier about the modern movie star system, there's more guarantee that audiences will want to see a famous actor as a character they already know than as a character they've never heard of before. I also wonder if studios get a good amount of profit from creating movie soundtracks. What we saw with the Barbie movie, which I guess can be considered a musical, is that the Ken song became super popular over TikTok and even on radio stations, which only built upon the fanfare for the movie. Actually, for The Greatest Showman, it was originally dismissed as a flop, but audiences got hooked on the soundtrack, leading to hordes of people, mostly younger women, to come back to the movie theater for sing-along screenings, eventually making this movie the third highest grossing musical in North America. So, despite everything I've said, I still love musicals. I do. I love the singing, the dancing, even the cheesy Lin-Manuel Miranda stuff. Whatever, shoot me. Hey, yo, I'm just like my country. I'm young, scrappy, and hungry, and I'm not throwing away my shot. But arguably, the number one reason I love a musical is because they emit a community feeling. The way that plays and musicals function on a stage is there's a cast, and usually the cast is multitasking. They are moving pieces around, they're playing multiple characters, and all the actors exist on one stage. So there's a sense of community interwoven in the medium. For film and TV, it's a little different. There is a cast, obviously, but not all the characters interact with each other. Especially for TV, there are lots of actors who could be in the same TV show, but because they don't share any scenes together, they won't have met everyone else on the cast list. Like for Game of Thrones, the actor will fly in for their few episodes and then fly back out, and they'll only see the other actors who are involved in those particular scenes they're acting in. The 2008 movie musical Mamma Mia performed great at the box office, as it should. And I think it's also a great example of a movie that really leaned into the community performance. The cast was having so much fun and you could tell. To this day, I have extreme FOMO about not being at the Mamma Mia cast party. This wasn't even a rap party. This was literally just a random party they had in the middle of filming um, because they just were having so much fun together. Colin Firth said of his experience, it's very difficult to simulate fun in a movie. 
It's one of the hardest things to do in terms of acting, actually. There are so many movies with terribly cringe-inducing scenes of people having a good time, where it looks forced. Spontaneity is very hard to fake when you're doing take after take and waiting around, but the spirit of the community we were in meant the fun was real. We weren't being asked to take ourselves too seriously, so that really led to a certain freedom. And I mean, there's a lot of reasons to love Mamma Mia. It stars older women with strong friendships who are lighthearted and having love affairs. It takes place in a gorgeous setting. The ABBA songs are classic and well-loved across generations. And it has an all-star cast. It's not a perfect movie by any means. Many things don't make sense logistically and Pierce Brosnan's singing was, was really something. Um, but it was so much fun that no one cared about these limitations. Jane Asher wrote a review for the movie saying, this is the classic time for us all to want a bit of sunshine, love, and escapism. There's nothing like a recession for making us desperate for a bit of light relief. And as we keep being told almost daily that capitalism as we know it is imploding around our ears, it's not surprising that we need an injection of totally improbable, fluffy happiness. At the end of the day, I think there will always be nostalgia for a classic Hollywood genre. It's why we see other classic genres like film noir and the Western reinvent itself over and over again throughout the years. There's also just something distinctly, uniquely American about the musical genre having its roots in American theater traditions like vaudeville and music hall, with most of its impetus coming from New York City. But no other modern musical calls back to its genre quite like La La Land, a 2016 movie musical directed by Damien Chazelle and was inspired by musicals like Singing in the Rain, The Umbrellas of Cherbourg, Top Hat, and An American in Paris. So speaking of these older musicals, the thing with them is that they mask the effort it takes to make them. Jane Fewer wrote about the musical's myth of spontaneity. She argues that the musical is technically the most complex type of film produced by Hollywood, but gives an illusion of spontaneity in the sense that actors just burst out into perfectly choreographed song and dance and making use of the seemingly random props around them. Meanwhile, the reality is that these sequences were heavily practiced over and over and over again. So La La Land updates the musical genre by actually presenting something that's very raw and unpolished and not perfect and a lot of it boils down to the casting. No shade, but neither Emma Stone nor Ryan Gosling are trained Broadway stars, and Chazelle told BBS that this was intentional. He said, I wanted to cast actors first and foremost, and just people who would really flesh out these characters with the same amount of depth and complexity and truth as they would if there were no musical numbers in the movie at all to help the lifting. And then the numbers can kind of emerge out of the emotions that the actors have fleshed out. Tony-winning composer-lyricist Mark Shaman explains why this choice positively impacted audiences. He says, Because the characters sing and dance like real people, and Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone are awfully charming real people at that, folks are more welcoming of them breaking into song. You know, it's kind of like what I said before about how part of what makes musicals so difficult for people to get into is just this unrealistic... Um, thing that is just happening. It's not realistic for people to break out into song, but it makes it more realistic for people to break out into song and dance and do it imperfectly. So in this sense, La La Land bridges the gap between a movie movie and a movie musical, making it more palatable for anti-musical audiences. Also, unlike most Broadway adapted movie musicals, the singing makes up only like 25%-ish, if even, of the movie. I haven't seen it in a while, but it definitely prioritizes a story and realist acting over spectacle. Okay, some of you may be thinking, Mina, isn't like La La Land very similar to Les Mis in this sense? And yes, they are very similar in that they both prioritize like this kind of realist form of acting. And I wasn't trying to dunk on Les Mis earlier. I was just trying to illustrate the differences between the movie medium and like the stage musical medium. Um, and why it's kind of like incompatible in a way. But I do think that Les Mis was so successful in part because of this like realist acting style that it leaned on, um, which is more palatable to movie going audiences. At the end of the day, I think the musical genre will always have potential for success, but the reason studios are scared to market them correctly might be because we got a series of musical flops in the past few years. Among the underperformers of 2021 include Dear Evan Hansen, In the Heights, Everybody's Talking About Jamie, West Side Story, Tick Tick Boom, A Week Away, Diana the Musical, Annette, and a high school musical, The Musical, The Series. Josh Lynn, president of box office forecasting company Piedmont Media Research, told Ringer, a lot of musicals recently have underperformed and pretty significantly. There were a slew of live action musicals that came out after Hamilton, and for the most part, they really disappointed relative to insider hopes. Kevin Goetz, the founder and CEO of entertainment research and content testing film Screen Engine ASI, agreed this is all purposeful. 
the studios are not doing this in a vacuum. They've got research to support it. I would imagine they cut a musical trailer or two, which just didn't test nearly as well in terms of conversion. There's always a reason for the decisions they make. They do very little that is against what the audience wants because the stakes are just so high. But he notes that trends also change. And if one musical does really well, then people will start saying things like, musicals are back. Similar actually to what people were saying in 2017 when La La Land came out which might end up propelling studios to reintroduce singing into their musical trailers. Okay, this is all I have for today. Thank you all so much for paying attention, for listening to me, for just being you and being fabulous. And um, especially if you don't like musicals and you stuck, stuck around to hear my ramblings about it. Um, yeah, I hope you have a lovely, lovely rest of your day. And I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>